to another episode of the Power Move Maker podcast. I'm honored to have a dear friend of mine for many years and a, a, a true Power Move Maker in the world of entertainment and music, Mr. Corey Llewellyn, known to many as just CL. CL, welcome to the podcast. Er, thank you, man. Thank y'all for having me. Thank you for having me. I've been watching the podcast. The power makers that have been on here are inspiring. The messages are always inspiring. And um, even before that, you know, you were putting these positive messages up that, you know, would just be like, yeah, you know, let me level up. And uh, I'm, I'm honored and humbled to be here. So thank you for having me. Nah, thanks for, for lending your time to, to our platform. You know, we go back for many years, CL, but for anybody who is not in the music industry, is not into, in entertainment, please let them know who you are, the company you created. We'll go into your backstory, but I just want people to understand exactly, you know, what makes CL a power move maker. Well, you know, in our business, you know, a lot of things we see are from the, uh, I was going to say from the, the top down. You see the artists, you see all of the glamour, the glitz, and there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes that we do to actually make them superstars in the forefront. And that's what I do. I'm a moving shaker for that. You know, I do uh, promotion in a various uh, amount of ways, online to lifestyle, um, to clubs and everything. But really, uh, I'm a power maker because we created a platform called DigiWax Media, aka DigiWax.com, which is one of the largest sources for music for DJs and uh, music supervisors around the world. Uh, every day, take new music from major labels, independents, major independents, and everything of the likes, and post it up on our site for DJs to take in exchange for their simple feedback. Uh, and that is a pretty amazing process because um, we were at the forefront of the switch or the, the, the change between what was going on between vinyl to CD and then CD to digital and being able to create a platform that, fortunately, we've been here for 20 years. And it's 20 uh, years? 20 years. Um, Congratulations, brother. Thank you, man. And, you know, we, we're just we're happy to just uh, have given our service. It's a free service for DJs. And um, it yeah, connected us with so many people around the world, man. Like I say, I'm truly blessed, man, to be able to say, you know, because of DigiWax, I went to Africa multiple times. You know, because of DigiWax, I was able to go to Europe multiple times. And, you know, like you were saying, being that way in these crazy times, you have to cherish the fact that, you got to see so much, um, you know, not saying that we're going to, it's over, but you know, the world is changing. Um, and, uh, you know, that knowledge you get from, from traveling and meeting people in the music space, it's almost invaluable. So I'm, I'm a power mover because I can help just about any artist get to a, a point in their career that will uh, help them gain audience and, and make money. Yeah. That makes you a very, very powerful person in the industry because there's so many artists, individuals that want to get into music. They want to get their music heard and they simply just don't know how. They don't know, you know, everybody thinks it's this silver bullet. One day I'm just going to create a song and put it up and I'm going to be an overnight success. But in many ways, your platform does allow the, the, the gatekeepers of the music industry to hear these artists' um, music and then put it out there to the world. So you wield a lot of power with this platform that you created. Thank you, man. Yeah, man. Before DigiWax, let's take go back in your story. Um, and I love to do this with a lot of my guests because for me, I try to inspire people through my interviews and I want people to understand that, you know, you, myself, we, we're just human beings. We're just human beings who are ambitious, we are human beings that understand that there are 24 hours in a day, but it's how you use those 24 hours in a day that separates us from everybody else. Before you created DigiWax, what were you doing with your life? Well, I was still in the music business, man. I was, I was blessed, uh, ambitious. Um, prior to DigiWax, I was actually working at... Um, first, it was working at Sony. You know, I was Sony, working, the first label you worked at? That was the first label I worked at, like that I got an official check from. You know, okay, stop it. Internship. Was, was, me. Okay, because because internships are important. A lot of people think that they're above internships. Nah. How many internships did you take? 
I took a few. I actually started out with Sony at Epic Records. Shout out to Lamont Bowles and Dwayne Cunningham and OJ Wedlaw and everybody that was there. Nelson Tabota, um, Money Nels. Um, so we started, I started out there. Humble, okay. packing boxes, doing that stuff, but learning. And then actually I went to um, Penalty Records working for Neil Levine. Woo! Yes, so Sean Pekas, Eric Paula, um, my man Chi Chi that was there, uh, El Ness. It was a whole team there that, again, it was it was learning from a major label to now this is an independent company and how we do things. We cover retail, we cover radio, we cover college radio, and all of these grassroots efforts that that can help you find an audience. And then from there, oh, Ma Martin Moore was there also. Shout out to Martin Moore. Um, and from there, I went to Uptown Records, and I was working with the wildest crew, Super Mario. Uh, shoot, man. You know, Uptown was, it was great because it was an urban culture that was more rocking as an independent, but they had major label power. You know, mm -hmm. we had heavy hits, Joe to see, Mary, um, all of that stuff. So, you know, I did that uh, under a guy named Jerry, and um, we worked in marketing, and that was really it was a dope experience, um, and then I started really rocking because what happened was I sort of got out of the music business for two seconds. Um, you know, one of the things that you do as an intern is you just run pe stuff for people. So running clothes from video shoots here, there, whatever. And I met a guy named Phil Pabone uh, who was working at Mecca USA. And Phil Pabone took me under his wing, him, Tony Shellman, and that whole family. And they actually gave me my first check. They actually said, you know what? We want to hire you as a grassroots manager for marketing and fashion. And I had no idea, no nothing with fashion. All I knew was that Mecca had dope clothes and I wanted these free shirts. And That's I took that, <clears throat> took that passion and said, you know what? We're going we gonna to rock. So I started hitting off different people in the music business with the clothes. I uh, started doing fashion shows all over America, all the black colleges and connected with artists through that. Um, and then, uh, I started, uh, I actually connected with a guy I worked with at Epic and Corey Rooney. And I, I remember giving him some clothes and he was like, yo, where you get this from? So I come to the studio, went to the studio and, um, boom, man, he, he just took me under his wing. At the time, he was a senior vice president of A&R for Epic Records. Working, uh, working with, um, was he working with J-Lo at that time at the beginning of his career? Way, this is way before J-Lo. This, this is, is before J-Lo. Yeah, he's still working with like, um, let's see, Mary and all the artists on Epic from Brownstone to like, uh, I, I don't know, there was so many artists at that time uh, that we was working on. Uh, Mariah was a big one because she was on Columbia and he worked more directly under Tommy Matola. Yep. And, and um, he took me under his wing and we really, you know, that really took my career off because it taught me an etiquette uh, about the business that came from a, an, a serious executive level on uh, how to be, how to operate, you know, how to focus, what to focus on, um, quality, quality of music, quality of what a real recording should sound like, you know, the process of recording, um, true mixing, true mastering, um, taking it all apart and doing it all over again if we had to, um, you know, so we, you know, that that was awesome. We was working with track masters and Diddy and every single person. At, at that time, were you getting a check? So, yes, we started, he started, uh, so Mariah started a label called Crave Records. Mm -hmm. And they, they hired me on a Crave to run the, um, yeah, I did so many jobs. So I was head of uh, video, grassroots video promotion or video promotion. Then I started running the street team under Morris Landy. And then, um everything was going great. They hired me as an A&R. So I had a group called Negro League on the label. And that was a great experience because at that time was the first time, I tell people all the time, I didn't really know the music business until a guy named Michael Kushner and Corey Rooney, they pulled me to the side. And, and Michael Kushner actually sat me down. He was the head of legal at our time. Now I think he's head of legal for all Warner Music, but he showed me actually how to read a contract. He sat me down and actually said, you know, you got seven guys on this in this group. This is how much they're gonna make. This is how much the label's gonna make. This is how the point system works. And um, I realized at that point that there's no way these artists were gonna make money. There were no, there's no way that these guys were gonna actually make money from their sound recordings and the royalties from the sales of these recordings. Just wasn't. It was just not enough to go around. Um, 
And in my mind, I was like, you know, this is where DigiWax, I guess, was sort of born because from that point on, I said, you know, for people to really make money, you have to go from digital direct to the consumer. And that was the whole concept of DigiWax. But before that, um, so yeah, so I was at um, Crave and that's, that was my first check, working under Mariah and learning from her as well um, and traveling and um, be, being sort of like an all around sort of player on the, on the court, you know. Can we take a, can I take a minute and interject here? Because I think your story is so interesting. And I think um, for anybody who's watching this, I hope that they're catching these gems and I hope that they're really pulling from this information that you're giving them. You took at least three unpaid internships that I heard. Um, you worked in very humble mail room. You're packing boxes. You go over and like, like I love your story because before you got settled into the world of marketing and promotion, you were working at Mecca and, you know, doing whatever you can do over there, putting clothes on artists back, running the streets and really trying to blow up that brand. You pulled in so many names that are now um, the heads of industry, you know, the Sean Peckers of the world. You, you just would name drop it. But these are people you came up with, you know, yeah. day one. And I hope people understand that this journey that you're on, I don't care what it is because it's all transferable. I don't care if you're in law, you know, legal or, you know, you could be a doctor, whatever it is. It takes time. You know, here you are 25 years later, but it took 25 years for you to get to this position of power that you're in. And I'm hoping that anybody who's watching this understands, you know, success doesn't come overnight. It is a process. And along the way is when you are meeting these, you know, we often hear relationship, relationship, relationship. Look at the relationships you developed from early in your career. So I just love, you know, even before we get into the, the, the birth of DigiWax, I love just your journey up to this point because it really shows how you're so connected and why you see the world through the vernacular that you see it in because you started out from the bottom doing any and every job that you possibly could just to get a paycheck. Yeah, man, absolutely. And I think that's a, that's, a, that's a dedication that anybody that wants to be successful in something, you know, you have to give it up. You have to leave the ego at the door and just do what you got to do and make friends. Get, get, gain people's trust. You know, can I trust you to do this simple task? It's, it's a big deal because even now um, with DigiWax, you know, shout out to my team. And we've all gone through it. We've had people that you can say, hey, I need you to, to do this, you know, build this email list up, go through this, this email account, take out all the emails and, and build up this account. And they'll say yes, and in a week it won't be done. And then you have a person that you say, I need you to build this email list, go through this email and build it. And in a day, they'll say, yo, I know I, yo, it's 8 o'clock, I know I'm supposed to go home, but you know what, I'm going to stay here and do it. And it shows you like – you know, star power, it's, star, it's just like the NBA, man. You know, people talk about well, Kobe was staying late and taking a, a thousand shots and this dude wouldn't go to sleep. He wasn't going to the club. Yeah, because he had the hunger and you could see that, you could feel that. When you get on the court, you, you perform like that. So that is the, the truth is you have to be humble and you just have to, you have to gain people's trust that, they, that if they ask you to do something that you want to like over deliver. You know. 100%. I, I think, and I love the Kobe example you just brought up. I think so many people have to understand, right? What separates Kobe is not because he took a thousand shots, because that's kind of a given in the NBA, right? Like, like I'm going to the gym and I'm going to take a thousand shots. Yeah. Kobe wasn't leaving until he made a thousand shots. So if he had to take 3,000 shots to make a thousand shots, yeah. that is the differentiator. So yeah. no matter what it is that you're doing in your career, you know, you have to be, you know, everybody talks about, I wake up early, I go to sleep late, but what are you doing within those hours that mm. are differentiating you from your competition? Real talk. That's so real, man. Um, that's, that's a gem. And that's what I'm saying. Like, um, I was just lucky to be, I think to take advantage of all of those things, like you said, in, in that time. 
because after you know the crazy thing when we was at Crave and I got that knowledge, Mariah and Tommy broke up and the label just died. <laughs> so I was like, oh snap, what are we gonna do now? And then the the story of how we met actually jumps in comes into play because after that I went back to a person who I'd met years ago and we was cool and that's what what happened the relationships um a guy by the name of rob stone okay you know, i was um to rob stone. i had given him clothes and and all of that stuff from mecca and he was like yo thanks and we just stayed in contact here and there and uh he was like yo i got a new company i just started it's called cornerstone promotion and um what's up you want to come in i was like yeah i'm not doing nothing right now i'm like let's do it and when i went there it was cool, man. It was uh, it was a small company, very uh, grassroots and and family orientated. Gave my own office. I was I felt honored for that, and um, I rocked with him. A guy named Lee Majors, um, uh, John Cohen, um, who else, man? It was a lot of. It wasn't that big of a team. A guy named Jeff uh, Ricks. Who else? And, and whatever the whole, but but Cornerstone was a was a very small grassroots promotions organization, and what we were able to do there was was awesome, man. We um, I I got directly into Mix Show and started really honing my craft on Mix Show, um, managing not just the urban but the rhythmic side of it, and became a double threat right then and there. Um, from from working records from Bad Boy to Atlantic to uh, L.A. LaFace, you know, all of these different labels. We were working all their projects and um, really getting it in. And um, we we were able to, it, it also taught me how to sort of be, just begin building a brand. Because mm -hmm. um, there we created the 1200 Squad. We created the Fader Magazine and things that are living on to till to, to, to now, um, which was, you know, just a, a dope DJ network, you know, with Enough and Green Lantern and, all these guys that are now. Was this your first? Was this your first position of directly working with the DJs? Um, I'm gonna say it's my second, but more serious. You know, at that point now, excuse me, I was um now more in tune. You know, because in the in, in the beginning when I that when I was working at Crave, I was working with DJs as well you know, servicing them, doing all that stuff nationally and everything. But my one-on-one -on -one interactions was not as strong as they became. It wasn't your day-to-day -day focus at Craze, was it? It, it was time? not all the way. It was not. It was part of my job. Yep. But it was a lot, man. It was like, well, you still got to go to the studio and make sure we get this shit mixed. You all know, right. and, you know, I was pulling crazy hours at Craze. I was doing it, literally trying to become like a Magic Johnson. Point guard, you know, small forward shooting guard if I have to, center, whatever I had to do. Um, but when I got to Cornerstone, it was definitely more focused. Like, okay, let's become the best DJ department we can be. Mix show radio, um, rhythmic, urban, uh, even some of the college guys, street guys, everything in between. But let's do that. But then let's focus on the superstars out of that. So we're gonna do this mixtape, you know, we're gonna pick two DJs a month. That Cornerstone mixtape is legendary. We did we did that, you know, who should we pick? Okay, why? These, you know, it was that type of stuff. All right, we got it, we're doing a photo shoot with Sprite. Let's build up this 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 team. Who we think is dope? Oh, Tony Touch, let's get Tony Touch. Okay, let's talk to Duop. Okay, let's talk to uh, Enough. And, and, and just putting together who we really thought had the talent, the flavor, that's who was down the culture naturally. You know, it wasn't really that hard. It was like, yo, no, nah, this dude is dope. Or this girl is dope. You know, let's get jo Joyce and Coco and whoever. Um, the reason and, uh, I asked you, was this your first position focused on the DJs? Because you've built a career. Your platform, DigiWax, centers, centers around the universe of the DJ. And you've done so much for the DJ in your career. So I was just wondering, was this the position that number one, helped expose you to the power of this DJ network, but number two, plant that seed. I know you said at Craze is when the seed was kind of planted, but now is, you know, the seed's been planted at Craze, but now is it being watered and you're starting to like, whoa, like this something here, I can really turn this DJ thing into, you know, what would be my lifelong career. Um, yeah, I gotta say yes, because I was, um, 
you know, they became a lifeline of a lot. I realized how much power the DJ has, not just because they can play your music and actually give you an audience and break your music, but because they're like, you know, I realized they're like the, the mayor of the town. They can get you into the back door of any club. They can get you into connected to the, the political figures in your town. They can get you, um, you know, into the studio. They have the key to, to everything. You know, they don't have to just shout out a record. They can shout out a brand. Flex could shout out a brand, as you know, with Ciroc or whatever, mm -hmm. and absolutely make it something that people have to notice in their city, period. So you start to understand that their influence is on a whole nother level, you know. Um, and, and it's funny because all these years, I have been around a lot of stuff, you know. I got to give a credit to my uncle, Junior. Because when we was young, when I was a kid coming up and everything, I, I'm from White Plains, but I, I used to, have to go to my grandma's house all the time out in Queens. And, um, you know, Uncle Junior was there bugging out. And he would take me around so many people, because they were originally from the Bronx, and, and we would just be driving around. And I remember, you know, Love Bug from back in the day when I was a kid. Him and my uncle grew up tight. And as I got older, I hadn't really realized who Love Bug was for years. I just knew he was a dope DJ. We'd have his tapes in the car. Love Bug Starsky. Yeah, shout out to Starsky. And we'd play his joints and Capri and, e, you know, the E Brothers, whatever. And I would have all these tapes up here. But when I got old, I started to realize, yo, these guys, they shaped this culture in a whole nother way. Being able to DJ, rap and DJ, and literally if they said something was it your 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 influence your money your power it, it increased like d nice did this weekend you know last weekend it, it, it would do that for you um and you know you don't even realize but it, what it did for me it gave me another type of confidence to know like yo i know these guys these are my people you know i understand this, this is my community so you know when we did digiwax it really was just to sort of give people an easier way to get in music because that was the problem. I want, I want you to hold your thought because now I want to segue into DigiWax. Okay. I remember this time very well. I'm an executive at Bad Boy Records. Um, I remember you reinventing the game. Um, when we were working in an analog CD world, you went digital. For anybody who doesn't know, explain to, to, to our listeners that time because the music industry was not digital. Actually, the music industry fought against technology, yeah. if you remember correctly. Of course, Napster and all of, all of that happened. I mean, shoot, yeah, man. It was a time. And, where, and, and, uh, and quick question for you. Were you always a tech guy? I was, I mean, my, my, my former partner was much more of a tech guy than I was, but I was always up on tech. Okay. Always up on tech, man. Shout out to my mom and got me a computer when I was a kid, uh, Tandy. And I just always up, up on the on the computer game. Um, and Napster, I had that early and I had other friends that would just put me on with stuff. But absolutely, man. Um, shoot, even, even last night I was talking to somebody, I just bought some more Bitcoin. Um, you know, I'm on it for the future. I'm a futurist, man. You know, I look at things that's going to come and, up. And speaking of the future, because I, I want to bring our listeners back. You know, we spoke about Napster. And I lived during that time, just like you. I was, I was part of the music industry heavy, where the music industry really pushed against technology. And they wanted to shut Napster down because yeah. everybody at that time was downloading free music. But I don't think what the music industry understood, and maybe, you know, this can lead into to the emergence of, of a digiwax. Technology was happening whether you embraced it or not. That's and right. I don't care what your line of work is, you have to understand that there's always going to be a change in industry. For us, it was technology. And the powers that be, the upper echelon of the record labels, um, you know, they, they have been doing business one way for a hundred years. Right. And now, you know, people are downloading and stealing music. And instead of saying, you know what, this is the future, let's work with a Napster. They did everything in their power to fight technology and shut Napster down. 
But at that yeah. time, the genie was let out the bottle. Yeah, He's man. No going back. Yeah, I think, you know, the music business, if it could take it back, it, it, it lost, it missed the opportunity to invest in technology. They could have easily did, like, you know, they could have easily either one label could have bought Napster and said, we're going to own this, or they could have all came together and said, you know what, we're going to cut this thing up and we're all going to own a piece of it. And they would have made that to the machine. Um, you know, uh, and that, that was with multiple platforms they could have did that with, you know. Can, 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 can not say, because for anybody who, who's listening who doesn't understand what a Napster was, can you explain to them what Napster was? Yeah, Napster was a, was a peer-to-peer um, uh, audio file sharing platform. So basically, it was almost a free platform for artists or anybody to put music up on and share it with anybody else without having to pay. So I could take a song, digitize it into an MP3 or MP4 or whatever format I want, a wave, post it on Napster, and now you have instant access to downloading that song um, anywhere in the world. So it was the first shared platform for music that really got popular. You know, it just became very popular. Everybody had it downloaded on their site. But the problem was that there wasn't a way to monetize it at the time. Nobody was paying for music. But yes. this is where the gym, you know, we're living in the coronavirus, right? The, mm. the, the era of the coronavirus. Mm. But whenever there's crisis, there's opportunity. That's right. Now, now, just bear with me for a second, because that was a crisis period for the music industry. Music, the way it was consumed, yeah. the way it was sold, the way it was listened to, it was changing. Yeah. The old guard could not embrace this change. And mm. guess what happened? And you'll remember this like it was yesterday because you lived it just like I did. Mm. There was another guy who had zero to do with the music industry who looked at what was going on with Napster in the way the music industry was not embracing technology and comes up with a brilliant idea and decides, oh, you guys don't know how to monetize on the new way people are consuming music? Or better yet, you're pushing against technology? Well, let me go, because y'all are used to brick and mortar retail stores. This was back in the days when people were actually going to retail stores to buy records. You go to the Tower Records, you go to the FYEs of the world, you would go to the Best Buys. Guy named Steve Jobs decides, Oh no, we're going to change the world. I have nothing to do with the music industry, but you're in crisis. I see an opportunity. Now let me capitalize and I'm going to open the biggest record store in the world and name it iTunes. Oh my Lord. And you know, he, um, yeah, man. So again, man, taking all these lessons, you know, the, the fact that he was saying, Hey, I'm in a, hardware and software business. You know, I have this invention here called the iPod and this iPod is going to be able to store all your music. It's the best MP3 player, not just because it's MP3, but why? Because it's connected to this marketplace, this store of music called iTunes. And here you can download a song for one ninety uh, 99 cents or I think they had it all the way up to 129 uh, for certain songs. And this music will go directly into this player. They co-inhabit, they, they work together. Um, and now you can take your music and travel anywhere in the world. We got these cool little white uh, uh, earphones for you to go with it. And it took off, absolutely, man. And it set the way for a whole nother way of thinking. Now, now the genie was out the bottle. Everybody was on it. And um, it's crazy because that became the norm. And we went on the next step even higher. You know, guys out of I think Finland or Sweden or whatever said, you know what, we're gonna create this thing called Spotify. And Spotify became a streaming platform of choice and sort of forced Apple to even switch their model. Um, to go but, from but evolution, technology, it's evolution. always changing. I'm, yeah. just, I'm just hoping that people understand, I don't care what the crisis looks like. No, dig deeper. No, look That's right. a different set of eyes because the opportunity is there. Look, man, you know, with the we were talking about, um, you know, 
what we're doing. We're talking about how we're all like in this new learning curve of going live and, you know, how it was setting our, our, our systems up at, uh, to be able to communicate through the internet because the world has changed. And like you said, there's opportunity in that. Like who's to say that somebody's not smart enough to say, you know what, Prez, power moves and this person, we're going to go out and just start getting you guys advertising. Do you mind putting this little logo in the back, in the bottom corner of your screen while you guys talk? Um, you know, there's money in that. Um, there's going to become other companies that are going to say, you know what, we created a network of, of mics and a, and a system that allow you to immediately interconnect um, to where, you know, these are te technologies, nobody built it yet, but I'm just saying that I agree with you that when it's crisis, there's this absolute opportunity right now. Um, you do have to dig and find it. And you have to level up in yourself. You know, a lot of people, I feel like, are using this opportunity. I'm not opportunity, but this situation as a way to, to, to make excuses, man. You know, nothing's changing. You're living, you're breathing. Um, I don't want to hear that you overslept. I don't want to hear that you you know, wasn't into it because of what's going on or my kids are bothering me. Hey, man, that's a part of our, that's a part of the game. You still got to score. You still got to find a way to get to the basket. So, um, yeah, I'm just, you know, I agree with you, man. And I think. Uh, well, well, yeah. I watched you um, in particular with your Digiwax because when record labels were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a month on vinyl, which all DJs love. Um, you know, DJ purists to this day will still collect vinyl. Vinyl sales are at um, an all-time high mm -hmm. over the last 20 years because of nostalgia and people just want to feel that wax. But your company, Digiwax, came in at a time when no one was utilizing technology to directly get music in the hands of the DJs. Can you talk about that? And, and, and speaking of that, were you the first, was Digiwax the first of its kind? Yeah, I think we were, man. I don't think there was a music service out there before that that was saying, yo, DJ, here's this new record from Nas. Download it here. I, I know we were the first to do that. Um, I don't think there was another digital record pool in 2004 that was doing that. Did you, was it a lot of resistance from the labels or did the labels embrace you right away? They embraced it. I embraced this, man. I got to, like I said, man, shout out to like OJ Wedlaw, shout out to Crystal Isaac, shout out to everybody who was like Jimmy Henchman, everybody who was like, yo, I'm down. Um, because they, everybody opened arms, man, was like, yo, I get it. Like, you know, how much? It was way cheaper than creating a vinyl um, and the feedback and the information. Can, can, that you, can you elaborate on that? Um, because there are going to be people who watch this podcast who are not necessarily from the music industry. And mm -hmm. you're saying that it's way cheaper. So I just want them to understand the value that you brought to the music industry in helping to usher in this new world that included adjusting to technology and how you save the music industry so much money while right. building your company. Right. So like you were saying, you know, labels, you know, I worked at Electra as well. So at Electra, our budget to, to create vinyl, we just have to make like literally 10 to 20,000 pieces of vinyl, two to each DJ. Yeah, so hold on. That, that, was, that was per single. Just, just per single. Per per single. single. Yo, Missy got a song called Work It. How many pieces of vinyl we need? We need 20,000. Okay, great. 20,000 times whatever that pressing was. Let's just say call it $5. Not even. Maybe $3 a record, right? So that's 60 grand right there. Plus the shipping. And now the shipping includes the materials to ship. So you need the sleeves plus a piece of cardboard to go in there so the records don't bend or break. Um, then you have an actual shipping cost of the actual vinyl that would go to everybody. And then you have to think about, well, some of these records would go to places and get snatched or they would get broken or they would get warped because of the heat, all types of things that would happen. Uh, and, 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 and you, 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 you got also got to keep in mind that there were, were, you know, you have your, your, your C level DJs, you got That's your right. B level DJs, and then you have your A level DJs. That's right. Your A level DJs, they don't just want two pieces of vinyl. Everybody else gets two pieces of vinyl. Your right. A level DJ is getting six, 
Right. They want it over and over because they're like, well, I'm going to be playing here and then I don't want to have to look for it. And you you know, you're catering to them. So, yeah. So you, you're, way, you're, you're spending a lot of money to, to make sure that your music delivered. Now, with Digiwax, we say, okay, we can hit 30,000 DJs, right? All we need is artwork digitally. Doesn't cost you much, just an email. Uh, we need the MP3s and different or the waves at, at a certain quality. Doesn't cost you much, just literally a transfer of, of content. I think that's free. Um, and then, of course, we would um, go ahead and, and spice up the email by creating a, a great graphic for it and everything. And then we would service it, make it available to our network. DJs have access to it for free in exchange for a, an opinion. And that opinion is what we all fight for. You know, we want to get honest listens out of, of DJ so that they play our record or... What do you mean? Hey, what do you mean an opinion? It's an important point right now. Right. So the point is that on Digiwax has always been a survey-based platform for DJs. We want your opinion. In other words, to download this song, we ask you to listen to this song, rate this song, and give us your opinion of this record or the best way for this artist to come up or for this song to become a hit. Uh, in your market or to you. It's what we want. Uh, and once you give us that feedback or submit this this quick little survey, it unlocks the record and you can download it and go about your business. Add it to your set and, and you're good to go. Why was that opinion? Why is the opinion from a DJ important to you? Because the DJ really understands their marketers on another level. They, they can listen to your record and look at you and say, hey, for me and where I'm from, you know, you are here. For you to grow to become to where you can go here, these are the things that I see that you need to do. So what, what I'm saying is they give you the, the best constructive criticism for you to grow as an artist to the next level, whatever that level is, because everybody's on different levels. Some artists, you know, they're not even, everybody's not the same. Some artists are not, mainstream quote unquote hip hop or R and B artists. They're not everybody's not a Chris Brown or a Trey Songs or a Drake or a um you know uh uh Migos. Some artists are uh uh more underground than that. You know, I remember working J. Cole, shout out to uh, Rich Climbing in the beginning and, and Wale. We had to take a completely different approach. You know, I had to take it back to like college radio for them. You know, J. Cole was was happy to go up to um to Columbia Radio where Stretch and Barbito and all of that stuff was, um, and, and and get up there and just freestyle. He wanted to do that and people connected with him through that because he was a boom bap type of artist. Uh, but to, to do that, maybe he didn't know what to do. Maybe he didn't have a CL. So, you know, fortunately he did so that I could say, yo, this is the way we're gonna get your audience going. Um, but the opinion of the DJ gives you that that blueprint of what to do to get to the next level or to take your song and get it played worldwide. You know, one person could tell you one gem that you didn't see and all of a sudden you're like, that's the answer. And, and I love that you're saying this because what people, we're, we're talking music industry talk right now. Yes, we But are. I mentioned earlier, these skills are transferable. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. And the reason that I asked about the opinion of the DJ, the opinion of the DJ really came down to a focus group. It's why people have focus groups because they want, okay, this is my product. What do you think about this product? What do you think about the packaging? What do you think about the artwork? What do you think? And in a, in a DJ's opinion, they can tell you right off the bat. And I'm glad that you spoke about it in terms of market because every market is not the same. South music, you know, it, it sounds like South music. West Coast music sounds like West Coast music. The Bay music sounds different from music that's coming out of LA on proper. But the DJs can tell you have a hit, it's regional. Mm. You know, it's a local hit. No, this is going to be a smash worldwide. And it can save you a lot of money because you were speaking earlier about we're spending, you know, upwards of sixty dollars to $100,000 on one single, that's one 12-inch. Right. Not the full album of vinyl, but one 12 inch of vinyl alone, a DJ can tell you, look, you might want to stop the presses. Mm. Y'all have already put $100,000 into this record. It's a no yeah. No Don't even, and save, exactly. 
Um, the focus group part, what you said, was is key, man. So shout out to Orville Hall, uh, a.k.a. O. He was working at Adidas. He's from Queens, came up to Hollis, and uh, he saw what we was doing. Came up, he came uptown to uh, Digiwax offices of Harlem and bought Adidas up there. And they checked out the platform, and he immediately said, yo, we got to go to um, Portland. Go to Portland. He's like, yo, look, I want to put all our sneakers that are coming out that we are in design form up on Digiwax. I want to start rating these sneakers before we go out and go to market. Let's do that. But it was important because you can use this platform, any platform that's like that, that has an awesome focus group to rate not just music. Now we're into fashion. Now you're into technology. Microsoft did the same thing, gave us a, a little player called a Zoom. Hey, what do DJs think about this? Like, is this something that could compete with the iPod? And um, yeah, I'm just seconding your point, man, that, you know, having a focus group gives you direction, man. Instead of you just taking blind shots, now you need to know, I can focus on this, you know, um, and, and you get to the goal a lot quicker. Yeah, you got to understand, people every day think that they have the next great product. My product is going to change the world. My product is, you know, this is what is the, the world's been waiting on. And then they wonder why it doesn't sell. Well, sometimes you got to get out of your own way because every idea is not a, it's, it's, it's not the one. Yeah. Like, like, you might get lucky and have the one, but yeah. if you... Get your product into the hands of the people who have, they got no dog in this fight. Like, like they, you know, they, they will give you honest feedback. And yeah. if you are willing to take that honest feedback, make the tweaks, and then re-implement your product to the market, nine out of 10 is going to be successful. But so many entrepreneurs that I see, they, they, they just, they get stuck in their own way. Like, they, they, they just believe that their idea is it and they don't need to listen to anybody else, and they pump all of this time and all of this money, and then three, four, five years later, when they are exhausted and broke, now they're thinking, I should have listened to what, you know, my neighbor told me five years ago. Yeah, man, that's um, that's how it is. And and I've even fallen victim to that. I've been, you know, being honest, it's like you do have to learn to listen and to let people give you that because some people are great marketers you know that's the thing like some people you know i'm a star at picking up the phone or going to see somebody and just connected you know that's that's one thing that i i have a quality some people can look at something and say oh this is the best way to get this thing popping um i have a guy that, that's in our crew called kawani he's like that another girl named erica she's just awesome uh we were on a conference call yesterday we had a call with, with raven simone's team and Raven Simone's manager came out with this uh, clairvoyant, this brilliant idea. It's about being open. It's about accepting the the constructive criticism that they may that you may get, um, and being able to connect with that person that gave you because maybe you need more in depth information. I think that's the other good thing about it is that it's not just the feedback, but it's also the ability to make a friend or an ally through whatever constructive criticism, whether it be positive or negative, um, but whatever feedback they give you, you can say, well, well, wait, hold on. Why you feel like that? Or what you think? Really, you think, you know, or, yo, no, that's a dope idea, but explain some more. Like, you know, I'm sort of getting it, break it down. And, and, and you become cool with people through that. You know, that's the other thing. We still have to connect. You still have to make friends and have people you can give a call to, you know, I think, you know, back to what our strengths are, you know, that's, I think that's one of the things that the DJs are in every city. And if you can call a guide or somebody in every city to give you a, a blueprint or to, to look out for you, you know, when you go to that city, you say, well, what should we do? Uh, help you set up the right itinerary. You're in, you know, you're on your way because you're going to meet more people. Um, but that's what it is, man. We, we're just a foundational tool to get your but, career started. You know, see now, I think that there's another lesson that entrepreneurs can pull, um, or anybody who, who is in the workforce can pull from this conversation. Your company started as a digital record pool, if you will, a digital promotion um, company. 
that 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 use the DJs. Um, but ultimately, you transitioned, and, and this is an important lesson for people to understand. Nothing changed in your company. You were first marketing music, yeah. but you realized that those same uh, influencers that you were marketing the music to, they can be used. In another way, if they if they have an ear for music and they have their their finger on the pulse of their communities and they have these built-in constituents that listen to their every word, why can't they also be my my ears and my eyes in their respective markets for Nike, yeah, or for Microsoft? And you mentioned the Zoom. Yeah, you guys really transcend to a life. You transcended into a lifestyle agency with Digiwax Media, and I don't know that that was, and maybe you can elaborate, I don't know that that was your your goal when you started the company. You started out with the, and I don't want to speak for you, but it sounds like you started out with the marketing and the promotion of music, and you right. realized that brands can benefit from the same DJs that we're marketing and promoting this music to. Yeah, um, so yeah, I mean, our original goal was to become a digital distributor. You know, we wanted to sort of, like I said, cut out the middleman uh, and have artists be able to connect to artists, market their music through DJs and sell direct to fans. That was and still is like what we are still on our way to. And we're still, you know, we're pretty much there. Um, but the lifestyle marketing stuff came up out of nowhere. We didn't want to be a lifestyle marketing agency. It wasn't in our mission statement or plan. We, uh, it, it got forced upon us in a way because I had a friend or two friends that worked at Microsoft and uh, they had a new device. They had just got there. They started this new lifestyle division and they were like, we were going to the Power Summit. Actually, I think I got pictures of you too, Prez, from the Power Summit, holding up a Zoom device. Anyway, uh, we, we went to the Power Summit and we had, they were like, yo, we got these two devices. They call it Zoom. Um, you know, just if you can, you know, let a couple DJs check it out, get us some feedback. Just let me know what you think. We went out there and we got drunk and we was like, yo, you know what? We just going, everybody we see, we just go do a photo shoot with them. We took the Zoom, we gave it to everybody at the Power Summit. I'll never forget it. We was in Dominican Republic. We went crazy. Every single label person, every DJ, every artist. We came back with like 250 photos. Gave it to my man. Go, go uh, ahead. Go ahead. Gave it to my man. He calls me back and says, yo, CL, can you come to Seattle? We go to Seattle. Every one of the photos was all over the Microsoft office. Wow. They were like, you're not only, you're not only in, but we got to send you up as a vendor. We need you to do marketing. And it, when they come at you with a big check like that, First of all, it was a shock. I mean, we, we felt it like we did a good job, but it was a shock that it re they responded like that. But we instantly became a vendor for Microsoft, instantly. Congratulations. And Congratulations. Thank you, man. Yeah, and it was just hustle. We're talking about the Zoom, and I just wanted to interject because some people might not be old enough to remember what the Zoom was. The Zoom was a direct competitor to the iPod, if I remember correctly. <laughs> yeah, they was trying to, you know, they call it the, I, the iPod killer and all of that. They was trying to become like that. But, you know, um, it was a great thing because it forced us to level up. So when you're working with a Microsoft, we go from being this marketing agency in Harlem to becoming a marketing agency in Harlem that's working with Microsoft. Nike, Adidas, and and it's crazy. Even com companies that had conflict with each other, um, and nobody stressed. Thank you, man. So um, it was about using our network in a different way, um, and you know we we were able to put together deals for like Mims and with Capital and. Can, can, we, can we talk about that for a second, CL? Because mm -hmm. it, a, a question of mine's it, it always what you guys had the direct pipeline to every DJ in America, but your, your service provided music to DJs globally. No matter where I travel to, if I'm talking to people about online streaming services, they mention DigiWax. Yeah. Talk to me, because you guys literally broke the artist Mims. Yeah. 
Talk to me about that process. And then more important, why did you guys not, because you were perfectly set up to become a, a, a full scale record label. Mm. Why did you not become a, a, a label? Well, two things. Uh, I think on the label end, I think we sort of caught mission drift, to be completely honest. Okay. There was just so much going on at that time. Um, and I think that we, I, A, we just didn't, we just didn't have our mind focused on that at the time. We still wanted to just promote and not really get away from that because I had a staff of people that I was like, you know what, let's just, we're still doing promotion and stuff. Hindsight, we probably should have started a label to be completely real about it. And it's not too late. Um, no, it's not too late. Actually, it's more in your favor today than it's ever been because, you know, everything is about streaming and getting your music into the hands of the DJ. Nothing's changed. Yeah, man. And, and it's the same grind in terms of like what what broke Mims was part a large part was Digiwax. The, 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 the fact that the record was getting to so many DJs internationally or the music was. And then we were actually taking the time to follow up and call each single DJ that was in our, you know, that that actually responded and downloaded the record. See, that was the grind part that 90 percent of our clients never did. They were just satisfied with getting the music to them. If you actually picked up the phone and followed up with them, hey, nice to meet you. I see you downloaded my record. I want to say thank you. I see you didn't like it, but why? And start off that conversation or, you know, how can I help you help me make the record bigger in your city? You know, DJs are wide. They, first of all, they just humbled and honored that you even took the time to reach out to them and say thank you. Whether, whether they liked it or didn't, just if you do that. And we made so many connections through that, it started to just bubble and bubble and, and it really didn't start with it remember we talk about the djs that are big that you know you have to give six pieces of vinyl to it wasn't those djs it was the djs that opened up for the big dj we didn't spoke our strategy was never to focus on the superstar dj because if you make it big in the club before they get on at some point they're gonna have to play that record versus where if you give it to them first and they don't like it or they don't, you know, a lot of ego that goes into this game too. Um, sometimes you just knock the ego down because, you know, the record just like, yo, play this. Sometimes it's a work record. And I always felt like the the, the, the opening DJs, the younger DJs, the DJs coming up, they were, they're they more in tune to breaking new music and playing new records. They have the time to do it. Their platforms are dedicated to it. Show them the love, you know, give them the little promotional item. Give them the love and they'll, 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 it will reciprocate. Um, but yeah, it took, it took a lot of time. It took a lot of dedication and the formula is, it, it's not really a formula. It's about just working and following up. It's really no formula to it. It's working and following up. We've broken so many acts even after that two pistols. We got a deal. Jason DeRulo blew up after that, after what we uh, helped do for him. Um, you know, even recently, we had an uh, artist wish we got signed to Jive. Um, the record I'm working now, me and DJ Webstar doing, he's now doing a partnership with, with I, I don't want to blow it up, but with a super duper producer, EDM producer right now, that's, I feel is going to lead to a new sound in music. Um, and, and it's going to be the promotion and the way we, we actually produce, uh, advertise these things that are just going to, you know, make a mainstream. And we are going to do it digitally. You know, I, I look at, you know, a year ago or a year and a half ago, you know, everybody was talking streaming, streaming, streaming. And that became the focus, you know, got to get Spotify, got to get on these playlists. We got to get Apple Music, got to get on these playlists, playlists and title and so on. And it's so funny because now when we talk strategy, our first step now is, man, maybe we should just do a TikTok campaign, you know, or maybe we should start off with a, a Triller campaign, which is the newer version of TikTok that's coming up. Um, you know, the strategy that we use that even goes to uh, 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 um, some of the blockchain stuff that's out here and what, what's happening in that space and how that's starting to transpire into mainstream um, world. But staying up on technology has definitely been our advantage over the years. Uh, understanding the future that, like you said, these things are going to come, these platforms are going to build no matter what we do. You got to get into the right circles. 
you know, we're on platforms like Crypto Mondays every Monday, um, listening in to that group of, of technology people. There are music technology groups on Meetup um, that I encourage everybody to get a part of because people are building things that are incredibly advantageous to, to your artists or to you if you're an artist to your career. Um, recently, there's a surge in, in Twitch, Twitch for artists. So Twitch is the yep. video game platform. Now artists are performing on there and getting donations, getting paid. I mean, if, 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 if my memory serves me right, you know, YBN, um, Almighty J and Corday, um, you know, they broke out of Twitch, um, taking advantage of that platform, that gaming platform. That's um, right. But I love some of the things that you were saying, and I don't want people to miss this because it it's just gems on top of gems. Like everybody, I don't care what it is that you're doing. You 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 spoke about you know essentially, and I put it in my words because it's the way I always say that. Love those who love you back. You know yeah. you don't have to. You know if it, let's, we're talking records. So what if Funk Flex doesn't play your record or, or DJ Clue doesn't play your record? But if the DJs who are opening for them, who don't have that big name yet, those are the DJs they rely on to tell them what's next that they should be playing. That's right. If those DJs are embracing you, those are the DJs you should be embracing. Those are the DJs that you should have your um, your artists calling directly. What can I do for you? Is there a drop? Can I do a special edit of my song and throw your name in it? Um, just whatever can be done, whatever your product, whatever your service, whoever latches onto it, love those who love you back because that's where you're going to build your core audience and they're going to be the ones who become your personalized brand ambassadors who go out and tell everybody you need to be using this product or you need to be listening to this artist or you need to be using this service, so forth and so on. Stop worrying about always getting the person who is the biggest on or, 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 or at the top of the totem pole to recognize what you're doing. It doesn't work like that. That's right. That person is going to embrace you when everybody else says that this right here, this is the heat. You need to be on it. That's it. That's it, man. That's it. So, yeah, I, I um, pride myself on that, man, because I never, ever came up like that. You know, it was always finding the talent and, like you said, showing love to people that accepted the opportunity, man. They was humble about it. They was willing to work. And, and, it, and it, everybody else comes around, you know, after a while. But, yeah, man, you can't wait on nobody, man. If, if, if one won't, won't do it, then somebody else will, you know. So you got to stay at it. I noticed you recently refreshed your your platform. Mm -hmm. um, why did you do it, number one? And what are the differences now? Can, can you tell me the future direction? Like, where are you guys taking DigiWax? Because in, in first and foremost, it looks beautiful. It looks so modern, so sleek. So congratulations on the refresh. It all, it, and I call, I'm calling it a refresh, but it just looks brand new. Um, but it's clear that you guys are going, you, you're forward thinking. Yes. Uh, what's the plan moving on for Digimon? A couple things, man. So, I mean, I, I'm just going to drop some big gems because I, I mean, why not, man? We, we're out here in this era. We might as well just talk about it. Um, our plan is to become a streaming platform as well for DJs as well as uh, the public. You know, it, it's, it's becoming that time to where we don't, you know, we even though we are service for DJs, we, we still want everyday people to be able to have access to one thing about us is that we always getting we always got music first from from artists you know before they drop in or before they actually go live so why not do that and um we're working on a blockchain project to actually do that um called the spin world blockchain project and it's like a it's a it's a dj plot project that um will allow djs to sort of connect their hard drives and make music available for the world um, you know, through um, through their libraries. You know, the thing is that DJs have the most extensive music libraries I've ever seen. I mean, I'm talking about beyond iTunes, beyond all of these streaming platforms. Uh, you know, when you 
when you do that. So that's that's one of the one of the projects that we are currently uh, focused on. But um, the more immediate stuff is we we'll launched two things. Um, one of them you'll probably start seeing by this week, next week, which is our Spin World podcast. And the Spin World podcast is really just, uh, I'm sorry, the Spinovator podcast. So the Spinovator podcast is just a DJ podcast where we're interviewing uh, DJs one-on-one and going live with them and really just allowing them to give their origin story, man. Um, when Love Bug had passed away, you know, one thing I had did with him was we had sat down and we did a little interview. And um, my friend who did the interview lost the footage, classic story, and he passed away. And my thing is that I never want that to happen again. Uh, one, I feel like it's our job to sort of preserve our culture and to tell our stories. You know, what is Red Alert's true story? You know, what is even Funk Flex? Um, what is D Nice um, as a DJ or as a music and a contribution to our music culture? You know. Um, I want to talk about that and something that I have a passion about. So um, we're going to do that and we're just going to do it from a, a straight, honest place uh, and just talk about and give these DJs a platform to just talk about who they are, where they're from and how they became successful. So that's one immediate project. The second one is um, our new music uh, Thursday. So every Thursday we'll be going live and it's more of a forum for artists to come in and just, play their music and talk about um, what they're doing, but also allow this audience of DJs and people like ourselves to give straight, raw, honest feedback, advice on how to become better, how to reach more people, uh, what people, what resources you may need, who do you need to connect with to help you uh, become better. So we're doing that as well. So those are our two like immediate things because obviously with the change and things and doesn't mean that you you can't level up. You know, you just got to know how to connect, who to connect with, how to connect with them, and get it in, man, because we're going to give away a lot of free advice um, on our New Music Thursdays uh, call. And you're more than invited. Everybody's invited to get into that. Um, For anybody who's looking to be invited, what should they do? Should they log on to digiwax.com and leave their information? Anybody who's watching this um, video yeah. now, Follow Digiwax, you know, at Digiwax uh, on Twitter, on uh, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, you know, we'll be posting information there. And we'll also have it on Digiwax.com on the homepage, so that'd be real easy. You'll just click and, and join. I think we're using Zoom as well, um, unless we find something else. But um, it will be very accessible, man, you know. And uh, we'll actually be, if you're on our email list, you'll get it in our, our blast and on our um on our other blast, the uh, 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 text blast. So, you know, we'll make sure that it's available, but follow DigiWax. It will be there. More than welcome to, to join on. We want you to join in. We want you to give your opinion. And we want to help artists, man. We want to give them honest, creative um, criticism and, you know, help them save money, save time, you know, get to it and, and not lead them up a pipe dream that's going to be full of explosives at the end and they're going to be out here messed up. So I want to talk before we conclude this interview, um, something that for anybody who's aspiring to, to create a business or um, has a business and is looking to, to innovate and to change and to bring their um, business in, into the modern times. Obviously I have some behind the scenes info, but I want you to just speak on, you had a lot of challenges. We spoke about the, re, the, the refreshing of the DigiWax brand and the site. Um, can you just speak from just purely an entrepreneur standpoint, um, the challenges that you had to really get this website to where it is now, how long it took, oh my Lord, money that time. was wasted. Uh, you know, I, I think it's an important trend for people to understand that this thing doesn't come easy, but if you stand true to your mission and, and you believe in your, 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 your dream, you can overcome any hurdle. Oh man. And, and absolutely, man. We, um, it was such a big learning curve and, um, challenge for us because, you know, honestly, we're not really technology people in terms of building tech. So, you know, we had to, um, we went through a lot of de development teams that we actually had another DigiWax built that we had to just scrap 
What do you think? So we are, um, so it's so crazy because we've been trying to revamp our site for so long. And we had worked with a team um, that went ahead and, and started to build it. And they rebuilt this thing. And um, when it was like near the end of it, we were like, this ain't it. This ain't, we went wasted all this time. And this is not better than what we already got. This ain't it. And I had to make a decision you know, after all this money spent to scrap it and start all over again. Are you and serious? How I, long? How long were you into this process? Would you say this was about this was from years, like maybe six years. To, you were six years into developing the new website real talk because we had wasted a good four years with another team, and it just did not. How was, much money? If you don't mind me asking, can you give me a round well, of well over? You know, because back then it was just stupid. We spent, I would say, well over hundred grand on you, that. So you're six figures lost. Six sight that the world will never see. We'll never see. It's still it's somewhere. I need to go find that link. I need to share that for, for just to fuck with everybody because that was that was crazy. Um, but you know what? It, it was it was crazy and it was stupid because we just did not know um, what we what we know now. And I'll tell you now, man, is that there are awesome resources out here that y'all can use to get things done faster and quicker. And it was actually a couple of good people that we got in on our team that reshaped our thinking on doing stuff because we have been so used to just saying, oh, we're going to hire this team and they're just going to do it. No, you got platforms out here now like, um, um, you know, uh, Fiverr, which is like awesome. Uh, Upwork, awesome. You know, where you can just hire people to do what you need them to do and it gets done. There's no more wasting time. Um, you know, crowdsourcing is now just as important of what we're doing now. It's a, it's a, it's, Finding what you need, graphic designers, uh, um, editors, um, people that build and write code, people that, that can take anything and build it for you, just like that. And uh, hey, Give me your top lessons that you learned through this process, because I didn't realize that you lost that much money, and I definitely didn't realize you lost that much time. A lot yeah. of people would have packed it in. A lot of people would have said you know, effort, like, you know, it's just not meant to be. Maybe this business model is still, it's not relevant 20 years later. What are some of the lessons that you've learned through this process? Um, okay, lesson number one is, you know, your team means everything. You have to surround yourself with the people. And I know they say, you know, the Henry Ford uh, theory, you know, but yo, you got to surround yourself with people that know more than you. That is one of the key things. Like, you know, I turn to people that I can learn from, you know, um, when it comes to my executive team and, um, and finding those people that can give me these jewels that I'm giving to y'all now because that's what it was. I had to find people that can re-educate my whole way of thinking, that, that fought with me enough to make me um, rethink it because I was stubborn, you know, and like I said, I, I had to learn some lessons before and fight with some people before they, they actually got me to think differently. So um, your team, your teammates, who you work with is key. Um, also your money, man, your money supply is important to know, like don't waste money, man. If you really can find a way not to waste your money, anything can happen. It could be going, you know, here today, going tomorrow. Um, Plan accordingly, man, because your money, your budget could run out. We ran out of money before, and it was just straw hustle and belief that we just kept it going, kept it going. And thank you to everybody who supported us over the years because you're the reason why we're here now. We're still relevant, even more relevant than before, is because yo, y'all stuck with us, you know. And I and um, you know, I gotta thank my my own hustle. You know, I didn't give up on myself. You know, that's the I, love thing. I, I was like, yo, I gotta, I gotta find ways to reinvent myself and become a digital agency and still, you know, get out here and connect with all the new DJs and, and new people that are out here making moves and become their friends and, and understand that, Hey, if I'm gonna be the leader, then I'm going to have to sacrifice and be the leader. Uh, it's not just about being too cool to work. Uh, uh-uh, I never got on that. I was always on the hustle and leveling up and reinventing myself and making myself relevant 
and find out what I what can I bring to the table for these people that to that will uh, help them. You know, I got access to this artist. Let's do an interview. Or I got access to this person. Let us bring them through. Or I got access to this product. You know, here. You know, things like that. I never never gave up on myself um, through this whole process and found ways to reinvent myself. Um, you know, other than that, man, you know, I think a lot of people don't know what they want to do. Um, and I think that's definitely one of the big things that you have to find yourself, uh, in, in some type of direction of what you want to do, uh, and really stick to it and get into it. Um, you know, I think that was like a lot of people just, they, they just sort of floating out here. Um, but you know, you need to take this opportunity as a time to step back and sort of say, you know what, this is really what I want to do and, and go for it. Um, the tools are available for you. Uh, I'm me and my daughter. We're now looking at Udemy every day, getting classes on there. Um, you know, she's trying to build a website and I find myself learning from her and I'm saying that anybody can get uh, Corsica, Udemy classes, even YouTube iTunes University, take advantage of this stuff, man. We can we can level up uh, and come out of this stuff much stronger. Like I said, I'm even I just learned how to set up an iPod, uh, um, uh, a podcast setup. You know, all because I was like, I'm determined to do it. You know, I want to go live. I want to do these things. So, my advice, to everybody, is to um, get into yourself, find out what you want to do, how you're going to contribute to society, whether it's monetary or not. And dedicate yourself to it because it's real. It's really easy to like let yourself go. Don't do it. You know, get into yourself, uh, find your passion. Mine's is in music promotion, music marketing, and go for it, man. Because we need y'all. We need help. You know what I mean? So, first, I want to say thanks so much for being a guest. Um, you know, I, I I think you provided so many great gems and so much wisdom through your journey so i appreciate you cl for anybody who's looking to get in touch with you where can they find you man hit me up uh at digi ceo d-i-g-i c-e-o um or at digi wax d-i-g-i w-a-x-x um you know what and i'm so real hit me up on my cell 917-337-3614 right now is the time for us to connect ain't no shame or nothing um, you know, you can hit me up direct, uh, hit up Digiwax direct. We're here, man. Thank you. Much love. You know, continue blessings. I love what you have done for the culture. You know, it's very few people that have created something from the ground up that stands on its own. I know many people might not know the name CL, but everybody, especially in the music and entertainment industry, knows Digiwax. Much mm -hmm. love and continue blessings. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me. Keep Peace. making power moves, brother. Yeah, no, no doubt. Be Peace. good. Peace. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.